everyone. Thank you very much for joining this science seminar. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm uh, Mubash Alam. I'm a research fellow at the uh, Center of Horticultural Science at Coffee. Um, I have been working on macadamia. Previously, I worked on sorghum and other crops. Uh, so today, uh, before going into the into the uh, our presentation, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Liki to change the slide, please. Uh, at first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their uh, custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. I pay respect to their ancestors and their descendants who contribute to cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contribution to Australia and global society. Next, please. So this seminar is uh, scheduled for 12 noon until 1 p.m. At the conclusion of the seminar, we'll hold a question and answer session. If you have questions that you would like answered, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, not the chat button. And you will, we will address them at the conclusion of the seminar. Next, thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Litchi. Um, he's originally from a computer science background. He has been working with plant scientists and horticulturists for more than 16 years, using his IT skills to help explore plant signaling, carbon transport, light interception, and distribution, as well as spray dynamics. At UQ's Queensland Alliance for Agriculture and Food Innovation, uh, horticulture designs for better light quality and for better um, uh, food innovation. Licky had led the development of a high performance ray tracer and an orchard simulator to improve horticulture designs for better light quality and better yield. He has also been responsible for a project to innovate digital twin technologies powered by high performance computing in artificial intelligence to reduce horticulture spray rate to, to protect the green barrier reef. Now I would like to hand over the slides to Leiki. Leiki, Leiki, next please. Thank you. Thank you, Mo. Um, hello, everybody. Um, as Mo just mentioned, you know, this research uh, was funded as a digital horticulture project under the Queensland Reef Water Quality Program. And in this project, we use water spray for tree crops as its case study and developed a digital time based solution to help optimize the spray practices. We all know that the Great Barrier Reef is one of the Earth's most precious and most complex natural ecosystems. For Australia, it's not only an integral part of the traditional owner's culture and identity, but also worth $56 billion in its economic, social, and iconic value, and is supporting 64,000 jobs, extremely important to the country's economy and community. However, this remarkable ecosystem is under increasing threat by climate change and pollution. Decline of marine water quality remains a primary risk to the reef. So the improvement of the reef water quality has been taken by the Queensland government as a key priority. So this is a video about the spray drip from agricultural pesticide application. You can see from the pesticide application, a large proportion of the spray simply missed the target and drifted into the environment as a pollutant and as a cost for no gain. The drifted pesticides then run up into waterways and plowed the coral sea to threaten the reef. Despite the huge efforts and the billions of dollars investment from the government, it has been found by scientists that the water quality 
improvement target is not being met. And at the same time, the problem is also frustrating the growers. On one hand, many of the growers believe that the agricultural sector has borne much of the burden uh, of the reef water improvement. On the other hand, the spray drift is high cost and unnecessary wastage to them for no gain. And there have been also been cases that the spray drift could cause damages to neighboring farms and cause millions of dollars compensation that the growers cannot afford. So the threat from of target agricultural pesticide is very serious. And at a national level, the reduction of a pesticide is not only for protection of the reef, but also important for the zero net emission target. If we can minimize the demand of the pesticide, the emissions from production, transport, and application could all be reduced. But at the same time, we also want horticulture to keep growing, uh, even to double. Well, that means more pesticides could be potentially demanded by the industry in the next 10 years. Here we talk about 2050, 2030. I mean, from now on, there are not so many decades before that. So I believe a strategic pivot would be the digital horticulture to achieve higher precision and then better yield, lower cost, and less pollution. So in this research, our digital solution is for such a purpose. It is based on digital twins powered by high performance computing and artificial intelligence to optimize in silico before acting in stu. That means to optimize within computer simulations before acting in the real world. Because once we, 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 we do something in the real world, once, for example, once the growers buy a new machine, a new sprayer, it might be too late uh, for them to change uh, the mind. So our ultimate purpose is to develop this into a practical decision support tool that can be easily and also widely adopted by growers to create a change. For instance, the growers can have a digital twin of the orchard, either by radar or by photogrammetry scanning. With this digital tool, they can implement spray simulations with orchard digital twin to find the optimal setting of the sprayer and then to instruct the pesticide application. The instructions can either be loaded into mobile phone, for example, to guide traditional spray practices with this, for example, a uh, very uh, traditional conventional sprayer, or the instructions can be loaded into robotic and automatic sprayers to guide online practices. For orchard spray simulation, a, a big challenge was in computing because we need to simulate at least tens of millions of droplets and each droplet has its own trajectory over a long distance across a large space to be updated every millisecond. And then we need to respect the unique features of the tree canopies. Unlike many other crops, the tree crops, you know, are unique in their shapes and an orchard layout also has their uh, unique features. So we need to respect these characteristics. So a dilemma was you know, between the complexity or accuracy and the efficiency. If we, if we want to have better complexity, better accuracy, we might have to sacrifice efficiency. If, if we want efficiency, we might have to compromise with uh, the level of complexity and accuracy of the simulations. And then when talking about this, is we talk about conventional computing. So our solution is high-performance computing. And we have developed a high-performance spray simulator based on digital twins and powered by parallel computing and complex systems. So here we have an example of comparing the times uh, for traditional real-world investigation, for simulation based on serial programming, and for simulation based on parallel programming. 
You can say that with the traditional uh, real world investigation, doing a single experiment, it might take approximately two weeks. With a, using serial program simulation, it could take approximately a day. And with a parallel program, approximately an hour. So here, we, when we talk about it, the simulation time, we talk about the uh, time of running these programs on auditory desktop, desktop PC. For example, for the parallel program, we use commodity uh, computer components, including commodity GPU cards. A full investigation um, for, for, for um, a specific research task might include many such experiments. I mean, you know, for using the traditional real world investigations, it might take months and even years. For using serial program, it, it could take um, days and weeks, but I use parallel program, we might be able to reduce this into several hours, especially if we equip with better uh, GPU cards, for example, or few more ordinary GPU cards, we can achieve better performance. I also would like to explain that here we talk, here we have a serial program, parallel program. Um, if we deploy these programs into, for example, into um, uh, better uh, computing architecture with, uh, with, with better performance, the serial program uh, will have no obvious difference in terms of uh, uh, running time, uh, running time uh, improvement, but the parallel program will be significantly different. And we'll continue improving this program uh, to make it faster. And we try to make it affordable and adoptable with ordinary uh, desktop computer components. Another major challenge is in verification, um, which is how to verify the digital twins match reality. For indoor experiments, uh, you can have very well controlled environment such as a wind tunnel, and you can have a stable operation of the spring facilities. You can also use sophisticated equipment to mirror droplet size and the movement. But for outdoor investigations, these are unavailable or invisible. For example, we cannot uh, place an entire orchard or even a single tree into a wind tunnel. So for this challenge, our solution is boldness, bravery, and cavalness. Uh, to be honest, when facing this challenge in the beginning, uh, we're not quite sure if it will work or not, but we decided to take the risk. So firstly, we choose a road of mango trees in Deb's Walkman Research Orchard, and set up some wooden slats. These are the wooden slats um, to hold water sensitive papers. So once a droplet hits any of the droplet, uh, any of the water sensitive card, it will print a blue point on it. And then we scan um, the orchard with a regal later and create a digital twin. So this is a digital twin of that mango tree rule. And then we spread the mango trees with the real world, uh, with the real world machines, and collected the field data. For example, you know um, the nozzle directions and the water sensitive cars. And after that, we simulated the spray process within Ultra Digital Twin. The same number of water sensitive cars were fixed on those uh, simulated. Uh, wooden slats to capture spray droplets. And then we compare the real world experiment result with the digital twins. And this is the comparison. The rate of each water sensitive card 
uh, was normal, normalized into a value between zero and one. The physical and digital twins uh, match each other in general. Uh, I must admit that you know uh, this matching is not 100% because of you know there are some factors that are beyond our, beyond of our control. Uh, for example, the wind, the wind speed. In reality, the wind speed uh, keeps varying from time to time, and also in in, in the in the real world, um, the orchard ground is a bit bumpy, and and the machine we are using is quite old. So we use aging machine with aging nozzles, and all these factors could influence um, the, the the result. But in general, we believe that uh, the digital twin based technology has been preliminarily verified uh, within this experiment. So te the technology allows implementation of computer simulations of various scenarios where the spring facilities can be adjusted to optimize uh, pesticide application. For example, we can adjust nozzle type, we can, you know, change nozzle, uh, nozzle spray angle, uh, the type of corn, uh, nozzle on off direction, spray pressure, tank capacity, spray attractor speed, wind speed, and so on. And we can trace the explicit movement of every single droplet from its origin to its destina destination. And, and the movement of the droplet can be updated in every millisecond or even in a smaller time scale. And with this simulation, we can evaluate the amount of off and on target droplets. We can estimate the coverage of spray over canopy surfaces and estimate the potential penetration across the canopies. The technology is compatible with the different types of uh, digital twins, whether it's uh, digital twins point cloud uh, scanned from the real world with a laser or with photogrammetry. As long, as long as it's a 3D point cloud, we're compatible with them. And this is the sprayer used for the field experiment uh, we have looked at just now. Uh, we can continue to use it as an example to demonstrate what the digital twin based investigations can do. Um, here, the um, for the sprayer, we only use the right wing uh, with 15 nozzles located in four zones. So each nozzle, uh, the direction of the nozzle can be manually adjusted in reality. Um, and also some of the zones, angles of the zones can also be adjusted. And the right table lists the settings that have long been used by the sprayer as their uh, default configuration. So we can use the digital twins firstly to say uh, the, if, the, if the default settings are good or not. So we can have a look at the impact on the nozzle location. Um, the digital twin based simulation can trace each droplet all the way from its origin to destination. Um, and this can help us evaluate each nozzle's performance in terms of its spread droplets hitting or missing the canopies. Here, the, the blue bars represent the number of droplets, for, for example, for this one uh, from nozzle 15, the number of droplets that hit the canopy, and orange bars represent uh, the number of droplets that miss the canopy. So in this case, in general, we can say about 71% of the spray simply miss the tree canopies. But those of target droplets are not only wasted for no gain, but also polluting the environment and causing unnecessary cost and risk to the growers. So that's a, that's a you know, a, a big uh, waste and, you know, 71%. And um, we can also look at exactly where the of target droplets end. Was, for example, in this case, the green bars represent the amount of droplets that fly directly to the air above the tree canopies. 
and the brown bars represent uh, the amount of droplets crossing the tree gaps, and the red bars represent the number of droplets that hit the orchard floor directly. So initially, we suspected that you know um, the nodal direction could play a major role uh, in in this uh, big proportion of drift to air. But after some slight changes to the nozzle directions, for example, in this case, for nozzle 15, we change its direction from 75 degree to 78, and a few other nozzles as well. We found that you know, this slight adjustment um, didn't change the droplet on the droplet height and miss ratio. It didn't change that ratio a lot. It's not obvious. Um, then we made some further changes, not only to the nozzle directions, but also to the spray angles. For example, in this case, this is the original, the first rule is the original setting and the result. And the second rule is what we, uh, how we changed the spray angles and all, also the nozzle directions. After this, modification, we found that, you know, the spray drift could be reduced from 71% to 35%. But that means the cost and the waste can be saved by 36% with no need to retrofit or replace the existing sprayer, which means minimal cost to the growers. Of course, this can also be used to equip uh, autonomic sprayers as well to allow the switch of individual nozzles on and off uh, so that we can save the spray drift across the tree gaps. And that way the spray drift uh, could be significantly reduced further. In addition to hit and miss, we can also visualize the distribution of droplets on surfaces of the tree canopies to evaluate uh, the coverage. For example, in this case, um, each, each of the cell, the color of each of the cell represents the amount of droplets that fall into that cell. Um, the colors from blue to red represent uh, number of droplets from lower to higher. And just now we look at the entire sprayer's hit and miss for the 36% uh, spray drift saving. Um, we can also look at the groups of nozzles in different zones uh, to see where their, their droplets, where their droplets end and then whether a whole we can adjust the zone angles or on and off to improve the spray. And uh, this is not only useful for the growers, but can also help the sprayer manufacturers to improve their sprayer design. We also try to say the impact of tractor speeds on spray drift, uh, spray heat and mist. Under the same sprayer setting, uh, this is a sprayer setting, but with different tractor speed, the heat and mist ratios are very similar. But, the, but in terms of the total amount of applied pesticides, there can be huge differences. But as I said just now, you know, uh, the, the, the spray hit and miss is not the only concern. We also need to look at the spray coverage. Um, the spray coverage can be very different between these two uh, tractor speeds, for example, seven kilometers power, 20 kilometers power. The growers and horticultural researchers can decide which result is better depending on different uh, planting systems and different pesticide types, oh, sorry, different pest types. The balance among factors such as pest control, uh, crop growth and yield, uh, cost saving as well as pollution and emission reduction, all these factors could be considered to decide which sprayer setting 
and a water tractor speed could be better. And this is an example of a spring on a mango trailer system. So we can say some floating areas, these floating areas, some floating areas are potentially overspray, which might affect those gross market values. One more thing that I want to mention that the complexity of simulation does matter. It's very important. We need to be very careful about the level of complexity if we want simulations for prediction or for decision support purposes. Uh, we can't, we can't, you know, just oversimplify the simulation, oversimplify the details. Uh, for example, in this case, we run the simulator for three times, but with different number of droplets per nozzle per millisecond. In the first graph, you can say we use 10 droplets per nozzle per millisecond, and the result, the variation of the re re result is very obvious. Then we increased the number of droplets to 50, 100, 200, and 300. You can see uh, the standard deviation, the error bar is get, getting smaller and smaller. Of course, the time could be very different too. In this 10 droplets per nozzle per time step, uh, sorry, 10 nozzles per nozzle per millisecond, uh, the computing time would be just you know uh, a few minutes but the result is not reliable. So this is something that I would like to share with our uh, coffee audience. Um, and in summary, the technology has some advantages. It is uh, time saving, resource saving, and it can help fast track research by narrowing the range of investigations. So previously, for example, we have a 10 ideas, 10 options in mind, but with this digital twin uh, technology, we might be able to reduce the 10 ideas into two or three and choose the best. It is capable of doing investigations that are undoable in the physical world. For example, uh, we can trace the droplet from its origin to destination all, all the way across um, the movement. And and with this technology, there's no, uh, there's no need to oversimplify simulation for efficiency. Because using these digital twins, we can capture each canopy's unique feature and each altered unique layout that match reality. Uh, and the droplet moment, the simulation of a droplet, droplet moment is driven by scientific models and or physical laws. And there's no need for the growers to retrofit or, rep or replace their existing sprayers with some e expensive automatic or robotic systems. Um, the program, the, the spray simulator can be deployable uh, to ordinary desktop computers. So we don't have to worry about uh, using a supercomputer or high performance computing cluster that is not affordable and not accessible to ordinary growers. The technology is also adaptable to various orchard systems and tree crops. So in this presentation, we show an example with mango trees. It can also work for macadamia trees, for citrus, for avocado, apple, and so on, regardless of what crops they are. So the ultimate purpose is to make it affordable and adoptable by the many growers. And only, their, only this technology is adopted by the growers, they can really have the chance to create real, real impact and a real change. I would like to thank um, these great people, my leaders, colleagues, and students across UQ, DAF, and our industry partners for their great support and contribution to this research. And also my sincere thanks to Mo, to James, and to Craig Cardiner for facilitating and organizing my seminar.
And thank you everyone for coming online. Thanks, Lichi. It was a great presentation, undoubtedly. So um, uh, one person raised a hand. I would suggest uh, you to uh, write down that question on the Q&A, please. Um, we have got uh, one question here uh, raised by Jessica Hinz. Uh, how often do you need to adjust the twin to reflect the real world? For example, to compensate for size and shape of the tree. Uh, sorry, the question is how frequent. How yeah, how frequently you need to adjust the uh, adjust the twin to reflect the real world. So suppose um, if I... you have big tree and small tree, suppose uh, in water in in a water they they are planting multiple varieties. Mm. So if you and even even due to the effect of blocks, the size of the tree can can vary. So do you need to adjust uh, that twin when size become larger and smaller? Well, yeah, that really depends on the uh, the ultimate requirement for the growers. Yeah. Uh, if they want a better precision, mm -hmm. I would say you know uh, probably more frequent adjustment of the sprayer. For, for example, from row A to row B, mm -hmm. uh, you can change just manually change those nozzle uh, directions uh, that might, and also maybe you want to replace some nozzles. Um, that might help really get a very good precision. But if you just want to a general improvement, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, probably, you know, you don't have to do that very frequent adjustments. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but I think a good thing is that, you know, uh, once this become once this this becomes a practical tool, we would expect the growers have their mobile phone, for example. Um, once they drive their tractor to row A, um, the mobile phone will tell them, okay, for this row, you do this, 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 this. And when, when they move to the next row, you do that, 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 that. Um, so that way, you know, to, to help them, yeah, uh, improve the practices. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have a supplementary question. So uh, regarding this, is it possible to do automation for uh, for um, adjustment of the of the of the nozzles? Because uh, yeah. if if that that machine can recognize the size and shape of the tree, uh, putting some biosensor or something like that, this can be additional thing that may be easy for the growers. They may not have to adjust by themselves. Uh, well, for the automatic system, there have already been some uh, products. Yeah. Uh, market, um, but there are also some problems. Uh, for example, <clears throat> there some some uh, system you know simply incorporate uh, sensing, uh, computing, and controlling all these components all on board. For sensing, they can use, for example, a laser scanner. They put a laser scanner onto the uh, tractor, and they retrofit the current sprayers with uh, uh, you know you know, automated, automatic control systems to turn the nozzles on and off automatically. Uh, but there are some problems. One thing is that you know, this retrofit could be very expensive. A single retrofit could cost about, you know, $100,000. I mean, that, that, that doesn't include the sprayer itself, you know, just a retrofit with this extra system. And the second problem is that, uh, I, I would say, you know, the second limitation at this stage is that, you know, the onboard sensing, computing, and controlling, um, you know, might not catch up with the tractor speed very well. So a tractor might, it might take only a few seconds or even, even a second for the tractor to pass a tree. You know, within that second or a few seconds, it needs to capture the tree, uh, the tree uh, features, compute, and, and, and control, and you know, that, that could be um, too fast for the, for the system to, re, to, to respond. So a, a, a compromise in the solution is to simplify the tree uh, shapes, for example, tr treating the tree architecture as, you know, cuboid uh, or as, you know, a square or rectangle, worrying only about the height, the weight, for example, that would significantly increase uh, the speed of computing. But that way, I would argue that it simplifies 
um, the, 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 or it compromise with the, the unique features of those canopies. So that's exactly the argument I, I talk about in the presentation. You, you have to you know, com compromise with this, with the uh, accuracy for efficiency or vice versa. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so another question raised, actually, I also had the same question. So one thing is um, uh, Kuomin and Chen, uh, they are asked a question, how do you measure the actual droplet heat and miss in the field experiment? Okay, so in the real field, um, as I mentioned, we can, we can, let's think about, you know, this is, of course, it's, uh, it's not that big, a water sensitive cars. We put the water sensitive cars into those wooden slats. So once the droplet fly to that card and touch that card, it will print a blue point on that yellow card. And after the experiment, we can collect those cards and scan with some, um, for example, um, uh, the a spray coverage rate apps. We can scan those cards and read the coverage of each card. And then in the simulation, we can do the same. We put on virtue uh, water sensitive cards into those exactly the same place. And once the virtue drop is touching that virtue card, we'll get the, 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 the coverage uh, of that card as well. Then we can compare these two. So yeah. that's also related to shape of the tree as well. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, because some, some droplets would be intercepted by the tree when they won't yeah. touch those cards. Yeah. 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 yeah for, for the indoor experiment, as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, you can use some very sophisticated, sophisticated um, equipment, such as laser uh, scanning equipment to mirror the droplet size and even movement. But, but in this case, we're, we're, we're you know, working on orchard. It's outdoor, it's open environment. You can't, you know, deploy those sophisticated uh, indoor instruments. So, yeah. Yeah, that's really great. Another question came from uh, Jessica Hens. Uh, what software language do you use to build the digital twin? Well, for the language we use, uh, we develop our own program using C++. Yeah, so uh, I haven't seen any other questions. So the question I wanted to make actually, um, uh, uh, Jessica and Kyungin Chen uh, asked you, um, just, uh, yeah, so that's it from, from us. I think we don't have any more questions. So uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation, Richie. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, Jim Hanan said, thanks for the great presentation for future consideration. Would you see any advantage to having scans of the entire orchard to see where the air materials ends up? Uh, sorry, what's the last to say that? For future considerations, so would yeah. you see any advantage of having scans of the entire orchard to see where the air materials ends up? Where the what ends up, sorry? Air materials ends up. You, you can click on the Q&A and you can look at the Jim Hannon's question. Okay. Do you see any, I want to see any scans of the target you see? Sorry for my pronunciation. Oh, no, 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 no worries. <laughs> uh, the, okay, uh, the in-air material ends up. So maybe maybe uh, you can do um, any any video scanning or any photographic things. Yeah. Okay. So in this case, we use a ground a terrestrial radar. We put the we put the radar scanner onto a buggy and drive around across the orchard. Uh, but definitely, we have also tried other forms of uh, you know uh, orchard scanning. Uh, for example, using photogrammetry is using a a drone like this size, you just fly over the orchard. Uh, the result is not as high resolution as the ground radar, I would say. Uh, but in terms of uh, hit and miss uh, of the spray, uh, the photogrammetry is, is, good, is good enough, I would say. And that is much lighter and much cheaper than, the, you know, than using the high resolution radars. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, just uh, any question, please, a few seconds. No, 
Uh, we haven't got any questions. Thank you, Lichi, for your nice presentation. So can you go to yep, the next slide, all. please? Sure. Yeah, for everyone, just I'd like to tell that this uh, session, uh, this uh, seminar is run by Associate Professor Craig Hardner. And uh, all the seminars list from coffee is available at um, coffee.eq.edu.au slash science underscore seminars. Um, and if you uh, would like to join a seminar, a science seminar committee, please, uh, please um, contact you to, uh, to the email listed at the bottom of this slide. Next, please. Next, please. Um, yeah, just I would like to introduce you for the next seminar. Dr. Bradley Campbell is uh, going to present on 18th of October on evaluating cell energy tolerance in taro wild relatives to enhance food security in the Pacific Island. Everyone is welcome to join in the seminar, please. Next one, please. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you for attending our science seminar today. If you haven't already signed up to our seminar invitation list, please do at coffee.eq.edu.au slash science underscore seminars. And we'd also like to invite anyone who was watched, who has watched our science seminars to give us feedback by scanning the QR code to the right. This will help shape our science seminar series in the coming year. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.